Hi, we're here on this beautiful fall afternoon to give you a quick guided tour of our hydroelectric facility here in Rochester, New Hampshire. We own the Spalding Avenue Industrial Complex, which was formerly the Tillotson Healthcare Building, and for about 80 years before that was known as the Spalding Fiber Company. Jay Spalding and Sons, as you can see, built this facility back in 1899 to 1900. This was their second location. They were about five miles upstream in a smaller location in Milton when they patented the first leatherboard process, which was also known as the first plastic material in the United States. This revolutionized the shoe industry back in the early 1900s, in which took it from a cobbler industry into a factory business where uh, thousands of small shoe factories sprang up all over New England, and partly because the Spalding brothers were the ones that revolutionized this process of making a composite material that would become the soles and heels for shoes. Now back when they built these facilities, many of the factories were along rivers because there was no electric power, no grids, no public service company in New Hampshire, so they needed water power to run their, their factories. Uh, and they were, of course, relying on the weather because if they didn't have water, they didn't have electricity and they would have to do a lot of maintenance in the summertime when they didn't have power. So they built these hydro facilities because that was the only option they had. Uh, the technology that existed back then is still in use today. It was built to last. Many of the parts we have here are still in use 100 years later and still working fine and run at very high efficiencies. The cost of hydroelectricity is the cheapest form of alternative energy that you can get. Uh, it's far and away cheaper than anything else out there and because it's even feasible to build a whole new facility from scratch which can cost literally millions of dollars and still produce hydro cheaper than anything else, when you take an existing facility such as this and just update it, rehab it a little bit, put it back online, you're way ahead of the curve because now you've got a very small investment and you can get a very quick payback. So we'd like to just give you a quick overview of how this hydroelectric system works. It was designed in 1899 by Jay Spaulding and let you know, I don't know how we've made it work today. Behind me you see the spillway, which most people consider the dam. What creates electricity is head pressure, the difference between the height of the water going in and the height of the water going out. This dam is some 1,500 feet away from the actual turbines upriver and creates a head pressure of 25 feet. One of the other benefits of this dam being here is it creates a nice 100 acre plus pond that many people now use for recreation as there is dozens of year-round residents now that live right on Spalding Pond. On the south side of the pond is our inlet canal. The canal comes down river some 1500 feet, feeds in through these three head gates. These gates are the entrance to the turbine area and as you can see this is all stonework that was done back in 1899 to 1900. Once the water enters into the head gates, it comes underneath the building and into the turbine area. The water then drops down through the turbines, which are located about 10 feet underwater, spins the wheels, and then drops it down what they call vacuum tubes. It comes out the other side of the turbines and drops down here about 25 feet into the tail race area. Once it gets into the tail race area, it continues downstream where it'll eventually join up again with the river. And as you can see, there's a road going across there, that's Spalding Avenue. Originally that was a full bridge, and in the 70s, when that road was redone, they took out the bridge and replaced it with a small culvert. That culvert is causing the tail race to back up, and it's causing the water to come as, as three feet higher than it should be. Well, when you generate power, it's a difference between inlet and outlet, or head pressure. The design is for 25 feet, and we're getting about 22 feet. That three-foot difference in pressure is about 17% of our electricity capacity. So instead of 300 kilowatts, we can only generate 250 to 260, depending on what the water level is in the river. So our project is going to be to replace that small metal culvert with big concrete box culverts, which will restore the water flow back to what it should be, and increase our electricity production by 
That difference in head pressure of three feet is caused by the culvert backing up the water, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 17% difference in production capacity can be hundreds of thousands of kilowatts of electricity that are not generated simply because that culvert is causing the water to back up an extra three feet. By replacing that culvert and putting in the big concrete box culverts, it'll restore the proper water flow, drop our tail race down another three feet back to original design, and we will generate electricity full capacity. The neat thing about our project is once we put those culverts in, they'll last 100 years. So they're not like panels that have got to be replaced every 20 to 30 years or 40 years. It's not going to require any maintenance or upkeep. Once we put it in, we generate it full power. This unit here is a Hayward governor built back in the early 1900s. And what this unit does is opens and closes the gates on the turbine. So when you have less water, you have to close the gates down. As you can see, the net wheel turns and closes the gates down. That reduces water consumption and power. Right now, we just had a lot of rain, so we're running at 100% capacity. This power control panel regulates the generator itself. You control the amount of power going into the fields and the best how much electricity is generated. Behind me is the water wheel that is connected to the turbine outside. We are now standing about eight feet below the water level you saw outside the building. The turbine wheel is then connected to the general electric generator, which is over here, power driven by the big belt. This generator creates 300,000 watts of power generated by our water wheel. Behind me is our substation. This is where the power from the generator comes out, is transformed from 480 volts back up to 14,400, and then goes out the overhead lines back to public services grid. We only use about 10% of the electricity we generate internally in our own building, and 90% of it goes back out onto the public service lines. I purchased this property in 2004 from the Small Business Administration after the Tillotson Rubber Company had gone into foreclosure as all the jobs making latex gloves had gone to China. We are only the third owner of this property in 100 years, and we have done everything we can to restore this property back to its original glory. Providing jobs for the local economy is our number one goal. The cost of this project, should it be contracted out, would be well in excess of a half a million dollars. Our grant of $165,000 will pay for only the materials we will provide all the labor, equipment, and machinery, just as we've done with everything else on this project. We find a way to get it done for a fraction of the cost of what it would cost for big business to go out and do it. That also will create more electricity, which will take care of more houses in the surrounding area, provide low-cost energy for our tenants, which keeps them competitive in the marketplace and keeps their jobs secure here in Rochester, New Hampshire. So please take careful consideration of our grant proposal. Thank you.